Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime and you enjoy my videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It would mean so much to me and I would love to have you join the fam. How have you guys been doing? It's been insane over here. Like our COVID cases keep rising and I'm just trying to avoid it like I just don't want to get it. So for today's video, we're going to be talking about this insane case where four girls died inside a yogurt shop, like a yogurt shop, like it's crazy. It's been nearly 30 years since the bodies of Amy Ayers, Eliza Thomas, and sisters Sarah and Jennifer Harbison were discovered naked and bound in their own clothing when firefighters discovered them after trying to put out this fire. And the scary thing about this case is that it's kind of still unsolved. So if I'm not making any sense, let's get into the story and what happened. So the victims were four teenage girls, 13 year old Amy Ayers, 17 year old Eliza Thomas, 17 year old Jennifer Harbison and her sister Sarah, who was 15 at the time. And the two 17 year olds, Jennifer and Eliza, were actually employees of the, I can't believe it's yogurt shop. While Sarah, the 15 year old and her friend Amy, who was 13, were in the shop to get a ride home with Sarah's sister, Jennifer, after their shift at the shop. And once they closed up, they were gonna all catch a ride with her and go home. And the shop closed at 11 p.m. And on December 6th, 1991, Jennifer and Eliza were working the late shift. So that means that they were gonna close up the shop at 11 p.m. that night. So Sarah and Amy, they ended up dropping by at the shop at around close to 11. And Sarah and Amy actually had a sleepover planned at Sarah's house. And yeah, they were just waiting and just hanging around and just waiting to kind of get to their sleepover and, you know, have fun. Now at around like 10 p.m., so 60 minutes before the shop was closing for the night, this man who was trying to like hustle people in the in the line for the yogurt shop was allowed to enter the shop and use the toilet and he was taking a super long time in the toilet and um it's suspected that he may have even left the rear door to the shop like jammed open and a couple who had actually left the yogurt shop close to closing time so close to 11 p.m when Jennifer actually let them out and locked the doors to the front of the shop to prevent further customers coming in also remember that there were two men still inside the yoga shop sitting at, sitting at a table and they were just acting really sneaky and shady and it was just something that this couple had noticed. Sometime around midnight, a patrolling officer, he noticed that there was smoke coming from inside the yoga shop. So he ends up um, notifying his dispatcher. The dispatcher ends up calling... Um, firefighters to the scene. So firefighters arrive, they end up um, extinguishing the blaze. And once they put out all the fire, they notice the four girls' bodies inside the yogurt shop. Each of the girls had been shot in the head execution style with a 22 caliber bullet. And Sarah, the 15 year old sister, her hands were bound behind her back with a pair of underwear. And she had been gagged and she had also been sexually assaulted. Her sister Jennifer had not been bound, but she was found with her arms behind her back. Eliza had been bound and her arms were also found tied behind her back. And all three of them had been severely burnt by the fire and they were all shot in the head. The 13 year old Amy, um, her body was also found in the shop. However, it wasn't found with the three girls. It was found in a separate part of the shop and she was not severely burnt and charred like the other three girls, but she was found with like third degree burns over like, nearly 30% of her entire body. She was found with a sock, some type of a sock around her neck and she had been shot too, but the bullet had missed her brain. And she was also found with a second bullet wound that had damaged her brain, but it had exited through her jaw and her cheek. And it's believed that the killers, they stacked all four girls' bodies on top of each other um, when they thought they were dead. But it's believed that Amy, because the bullet had missed her brain and she didn't die instantly, that she had managed to sort of crawl 
crawl away from the other girls maybe trying to get help until maybe either the fire you know eventually killed her or if her wounds just ended up killing her um, as she was crawling away. Autopsy results also show that there was probably um, high levels of an accelerant used so the fire was obviously um, intentionally started. It was arson. Detective Jones was the investigator in the case together with his partner Mike Huckabee and they said that when they arrived at the scene it was super cold, it was smoky, there was burnt insulation everywhere and, and the vibe of the place just had this this cold feeling of death. And he says that you know when he saw the things he saw in Vietnam in the war he um, thought nothing could ever match what he had experienced there but to come here and see this kind of thing happen in a local shop, you know, in an area down the street, like from where you live, it will forever be burned in his memory. It's something that he will never be able to forget. And the gross thing is that the three girls that were left stacked on top of each other, so Amy, she crawled away, but the three girls that were left stacked up on top of each other, the flames obviously caused so much damage that the three of their bodies like melted together into like a stack and one was assaulted, Sarah, and the others were just, yeah, just execution style shot. And Detective Jones said that he had seen multiple homicides, but he had never seen four, you know, in one go where they were hurt so gruesome. Like it was a brutal crime. It was so brutal. So like we all know, you know, DNA and forensic testing and everything has changed so much, but this case took place in 1991. And the main problem with this case was that, well, was, was the lack of evidence. There was such li little evidence because of the fire. And then not only the fire that, you know, that burnt everything, but the, f the firefighters then came and trying to, you know, stop the fire. They ended up, you know, putting water and everything and the water together with the fire, like it just damaged so much and like got rid of so much evidence. And Detective Huckabee, he says that if the crime had happened today, it would have just been so different um, because we would have been able to process the scene a lot better with the technology we have today as opposed to back then. I mentioned before that a 22 caliber pistol was used to shoot the girls in the head, but I forgot to mention they also found like signs that a 38 caliber pistol was used. So there were two guns used in the crime and they believe that the perpetrator probably used the back door, the rear back door, to exit after committing these crimes. So maybe that man at the beginning did leave it open for them, or maybe it just was unrelated, but that's what their theory was. And the way that the crime was committed, the fact that, you know, they did it around closing time when there would be less people around, the fact that they destroyed the evidence with fire, with arson, the fact that it all took place kind of in an organized way and they were able to control the victims, the girls, they were able to obviously scare them enough. So the police believed that the perpetrators were most likely adults as opposed to being teenagers because it just seemed like a more like advanced sort of crime. And remember one of the victims had been sexually assaulted. So they also had DNA from a male as part of their evidence collection. So Detective Jones and Huckabee, they like because of the nature of the crime and how brutal it was and they believed it to be sadistic and almost satanic. So they started looking out for these types of suspects and trying to pin the crime sort of on anyone in the area that had been or involved in those types of activities, including a serial killer named Kenneth McDuff. And he has been known to commit at least between nine and 14 murders. And when he was accused of this, Kenneth stated that had I done it, I would actually admit to it because I would have been proud that I did it. So the investigators opened up a tip line to just see if anyone had seen anything. And despite endless amounts of tips rolling in all the detectives sort of ended up with was dead end after dead end like it was it was leading nowhere they said the phone for the tip line would never stop ringing they just had stacks and stacks and stacks of tips at one point the police had 342 suspects to investigate based off of what they knew so they knew there was definitely a male present because they had the male's dna from the assault they knew that two guns were um being used 22 caliber and a 38 caliber 
And then that $542 was missing from the cash register at the store. And then they also noted that when firefighters were actually trying to access the fire, the front doors were locked, which if you remember, I said that, um, I think it was Jennifer, she was locking the doors um, prior to closing time and the store protocol was to lock the doors 10 minutes before closing time. So then investigators decided to focus on the perpetrators being possibly young teens. Remember those two boys that had been seen, or two men that had been seen um, still inside the store acting sneakily. And there was a 16 year old guy, teen, who was arrested at the North Cross Mall because he had a gun with him. So his name was Maurice Pearson and the police was like, okay, let's focus on this guy. Detective Pierce said he sounded good. So they decided to move in on him. Maurice Pierce was also hanging out with three of his friends on the, oh my God, look at the fallout. So his four friends were Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen and Forrest Wellborn. But the ballistics in the gun didn't actually match the ballistics of the weapons used during the crime. So because of this, they got up to a point where they were like, okay, we can't really go anywhere further with these boys. The high profile nature of the case also added new elements to the case that the detectives had to deal with, which was false confessions. Police admit to getting over 50 confessions, six of them written and signed, and one even from that serial killer, Kenneth McDuff. And Kenneth McDuff actually confessed to these murders on the day of his execution on November 17th, 1998. But investigators agreed that any sort of confessions had to be backed up by solid factual evidence. They said they weren't gonna sign on the line or implicate anyone unless they had, you know, clear evidence that this person or these people were involved beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's because they wanted, they felt like they owed it to the families to get it right, to not mess this up. And I feel like that must be, it must be hard for the detectives because it's so much pressure to, you know, get it right. I mean, especially if the fire burned everything and then water sort of destroyed everything, it's, it's really hard, you know, for them to, it would just be really hard to crack the case. And the sad thing is, was that four young girls were the victims and you want to get justice. You want to figure out who did this because it's such a brutal crime. So in 1998, after nearly eight years on the case, the detectives Jones and Huckabee, who were on the case, they made no arrests. They came up with no new leads. So they were taken off the case. And as they were taken off the case, they were then replaced with new investigators. In 1999, the new investigators they ended up making four arrests, the same boys that the previous detectives had initially zoomed in on. Maurice Pierce, Michael Scott, Forrest Wellborn, and Robert Springsteen. These new detectives theorized that these four teens were credible suspects. By that time, they were now in their 20s, and these were the same boys who were picked up, you know, at the mall, and they were released because their ballistics did not match. So now, once they were picked up again, a massive string of interrogations took place, and this time, confessions were obtained from some of these four suspects. And then suspicions began to arise that the initial two detectives, Huckabee and Jones, had actually screwed up by letting these kids go. Michael Scott was the first to confess to these new detectives. And I'll just read from what his um, confession was. He stated that he remembered looking at this girl and he heard the gun go off. I only pulled the trigger once. I heard another gun go off. I think I heard a total of five shots. So the detective says, come on, Michael, you're doing good. Tell us, let's do this today. Let's just do it. Michael then says, I remember one girl screaming. She was terrified. So it wasn't really a confession, but I guess he's telling them what happened at the time of the crime. And then Robert Springsteen, he also starts explaining what may have happened on that night. And I'm not going to say what the interview was because it's pretty well, like graphic, but basically the detective says, you know it, you know you raped her, like, just say it, just say it. And then Robert begins to describe how he raped her, like, in just very nasty words. The police's theory was that at the time, these four boys just planned to rob the yogurt shop. They said Maurice, Michael, and Robert entered the shop while Forrest 
just stayed sort of as a lookout. And then they think that something just kind of went wrong once the girls were tied up. The police theorized that maybe Robert saw an opportunity to rape one of the girls and that kind of messed everything up. And then once they killed all the girls to destroy any evidence, they started a fire. Forrest, the boy who the police um, suspected that was he was the lookout, he's always sort of maintained the same story. He has always denied being involved in the crime at all and that he wasn't even a lookout. He states he had nothing to do with any of this. And he also claims that police tried to coerce a false confession out of him, but he never cracked. And in an interview that he did with 48 Hours, he said the detectives tried to get him to confess that they would get in his face and tell him exactly what to say. And they wanted him to say the same thing or write a, write a statement. But he was like, I'm not going to confess to something I didn't do. And then despite arresting all men on murder charges, they actually couldn't um, indict Forrest. Like they couldn't make any charges stick to him because he had never admitted to anything. They actually tried to do this to him twice and both times the jury failed to indict him. Charges were also dropped against Maurice Pierce, who was initially the boy picked up at the mall because he had the gun on him. And police were convinced he was the mastermind, but there was literally no evidence to prove anything. So Maurice and Forrest were the two people who didn't confess. And Robert and Michael were the ones who gave the confession. So Robert, he basically confessed that he raped one of the girls. And then... um. Michael confessed that, you know, they hurt the girls and they tied them up and things like that. So the cases against Maurice and Forrest fell apart, but the ones that stuck were the cases against Michael and Robert. And this was, again, thanks to their confessions, but claims later arise that that they were coerced. Robert states that he was berated and berated and berated until he said what the police wanted um, him to say about the rape, that, you know, he did it and things like that. But one thing I didn't understand was... Okay, if he confesses to the rape, you had the DNA, right? Why didn't why wasn't Robert's DNA matched if he was the one that did it? So in May 2001, Robert's trial officially began, and at the time, he was married and working in a stockroom. And ever since then, Robert, he always maintained his innocence, and his defense stated there's literally no evidence linking him to the crime. There's no DNA, no ballistics, no blood, no hair, there's nothing. But Robert was just having a hard time explaining why he actually confessed to a crime he didn't commit. Because ironically, it was the only reason why he was ever indicted. So I'm sure a lot of you guys, you guys are all true crime fans. I'm sure you guys know a lot about coerced confessions. But if you don't, I would suggest you read up on it. It's very interesting and it's very real. I never understand why people confess to things they didn't do, but we know from studies that the psychological impact is real and it's huge. Even Robert stated that the false confession that he gave, he'll never understand the psychological reasons why he even did it. So Robert's lawyer was this big time Texan um, lawyer named Joe Sawyer. And he stated that the police knew that they were going to get a confession out of Robert and that was that. They were going to do it and they knew they were going to do it and they weren't going to let him go until he gave a confession. He states that the police weren't going to let him leave the room um, without getting a confession and they got him isolated and they got him to confess and that's exactly what they wanted. The only thing that was noted to be kind of strange about Robert's confession is that he did get some of the details of the crime correct, like the position of Amy's body, you know, the one 13 year old that crawled away. And then the fact that a 38 caliber gun had been used at the scene. Robert's lawyer states that the reason why Robert even knew any of this was when, you know, this was a big media hoopla circus that these details were floating around by word of mouth and Robert must've just heard it. And his lawyer states that a lot of the details of the case were known by many of the young children in the area because they had been following the case after everything took place. The original detective, um, Detective Jones, who was the original detective on the case, duh, and he states the language used in the written statement was just not that of a normal person and was definitely fed by investigators. And one part where they're talking about the fire where it reads, I had a Zippo lighter with me and I lit the fire. And as I lit it, I heard the whoosh sound of the accelerant as it caught fire. He said the word accelerant was not just a common word used. 
Because at the time, who refers to lighter fluid as accelerant? And he's like, that's cop talk. So he believes that clearly these words were fed to Robert and Michael. So the original detectives, Jones and Huckabee, were almost insulted that they weren't um, called in to consult when the new detectives in the case were, you know, reopening the case. Well, not reopening, but investigating the case again. And even more so because they picked up the four suspects that Jones and Huckabee initially believed to be suspects. And they thought it was kind of stupid that they weren't called in because they spoke to these suspects immediately after the crime took place. So when everything was still fresh and they said they had them in and they didn't get anything close to a confession out of them. And especially because they were still juveniles at that time, they didn't believe that these young kids could just hold that kind of information in if they had committed these crimes, which I think is kind of true. Because if these guys had committed the crime and at that age they were so young, wouldn't one of them have cracked? I mean, they were interviewed a few times and they did have a gun on them. Like they had reason to be scared, but why would they confess later and then not when they're kids? Was it the fact that different detectives were interviewing them? Different techniques were being used? And don't you think he has a point? Like if you're not going to get four teenagers to confess, how are you going to get four grown adults to confess? So what ended up happening was two out of the four men ended up going to trial. So Michael and, f who was it? Michael and Robert. And the prosecution went into great detail about the horrific nature of the crime. And they talked about everything that happened to these poor young girls. But in doing so, there was no hard evidence presented. So other than the confessions, the jury really had nothing to really go on. So for 13 hours, jurors deliberated. And then Robert Springsteen was found guilty and sentenced to Texas death row. Nearly two years later, Michael Scott was then tried like at his own trial and he was found guilty as well and sentenced to life in prison. Um, and he was given this sentence because he was a juvenile at the time the crime took place. He was only 15 years old. However, the prosecution's tactics, so at each of their trials, they used excerpts excerpts, excerpts, excerpts from the confessions of each of the boys at their own trials. Does that make sense? So at Michael's trial, they would use parts of the confession um, from Robert. And then at Robert's trial, they would use Michael's confession. And this tactic was um, ruled to have been against the confrontation clause. So the confrontation, con so the confrontation clause, confrontation clause is basically the right to have face-to-face -face confrontations with a witness who is offering testimonial evidence against another, um, and that's in the form of cross-examination. So they basically should have the right to cross-examine a witness who's giving a confession talking about the accused. Does that make any sense? Da -da 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 -da. So if... Robert's confession talked about Michael doing something in the crime and Michael was on trial. Michael's defense should have had the right to confront Robert and cross-examine him based on the statements he was making. So then in 2006, both Robert and Michael's confessions were overturned because their confessions were used against each other and they were never given the opportunity to cross-examine one another. So basically their constitutional rights were violated they went free in 2009 and they would need to be offered brand new trials. And the prosecution was like, yeah, we're going to do exactly that. They wanted to retry them for these crimes. So now because time had passed and forensic evidence and DNA, blah, 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 was, you know, the testing was much better. Prosecution, the prosecution was hoping to get it right this time. So I guess to answer my own question from before, um, Robert claimed that, hold on, in Robert's confession... Is this lipstick ugly? What do you guys think? I think it's kind of ugly. I'm going to leave it on. <laughs> so, okay. Robert said that he, just ignore my ugly lipstick. So Robert said that he uh, confessed initially that he had raped one of the victims. So because, and I guess it's answering my own question from before, because the DNA of the suspect was found inside Sarah, there's new technology now, right? So let's match the DNA and see if Robert's the match. But the DNA from Sarah didn't match Robert 
and it also didn't match any of the other three boys, Michael, Forrest, or Maurice. They know that Robert didn't rape her, that's scientifically proven that it's not true, but the prosecution was so hell-bent on retrying these boys that after months and months of delays and, you know, with the evidence not really being what they were expecting to find, um, a judge released Robert and Michael and they were free while they were waiting for their new trials to begin. On December 23rd, 2010, an Austin police officer, Frank Wilson, and his rookie partner, um, Bradley Smith, they were just conducting like a routine traffic stop. And this vehicle that they were conducting the stop on happened to be driven by Maurice Pierce. Now they pulled over the vehicle and then when Maurice realized what was happening, he ended up getting out of the car and he ran. There was a short um, foot pursuit and uh, Frank, he ends up, the police officer Frank, he ends up tackling Maurice to the ground. And after a struggle, Maurice ends up pulling a knife from his belt and then stabbing Frank in his neck. Frank, the officer, ended up somehow surviving that injury. And then he, as Maurice is running away, he pulls out his gun and he shoots Maurice um, dead. So till this day, technically, Robert and Michael are still awaiting a retrial because... People believe that the investigators just don't want to admit that they may have gotten their information wrong, that, you know, they got the wrong guys. But the investigators' theory is that if the DNA didn't match any of the four boys, there must have been a fifth suspect with them. Amber Farrelly is a defense attorney who's dedicated much of her time to the case because she really wants to prove and convict who really were the killers. And she says that the fact that the investigators now are you know, suspecting that, oh, there must be a fifth man involved, that it's just ridiculous, that why was a fifth man never ever mentioned back, you know, in the 90s when it was taking place, that the four boys have never even talked about a fifth person being, like there even being a chance of a fifth person being around. And the DA's office has never mentioned a fifth man. She, she just believes there is no fifth man. It's just a tactic to keep trying these guys. The area where the, I can't believe it's yogurt shop was actually located was close to two major highways. So she also believes that it would, would have been easy for the murderers to just come in and out and um, attack them and get out via the highways just really easily. And she believes it definitely wasn't a crime of opportunity, that it was definitely planned and something that was premeditated. This defense attorney believes that the killers were actually inside the yoga place on the night of the crime and that the police have just missed it. She says she knows exactly who killed those four girls, that this man's, if it is one man, um, his DNA profile is with them. And she says she knows who it is, but she just doesn't know his name. And when she put together a timeline of what happened that night, um, there were two men who were never interviewed by the police. These men were never identified and never talked to. And throughout the course of the investigation, they have discovered that there were 52 people inside that yogurt shop that day. And several customers and witnesses claim that there was at least one guy left in the shop. And most of them say that there were two men left in the shop that night. These two, you know, shady guys were still in the shop at the time of closing. Remember those two guys I mentioned that the couple saw when they were leaving the store that were just sitting at the table acting sneakily? Well, these were the last two people there apart from the girls and then possibly that, um, that man who was like hustling and used the bathroom, but he is thought to have just left out through the back door. These men are described as one of them having lighter hair, dirty blonde in his 20s or 30s, and he was wearing an army fatigue style coat. And then the other is said to have been like a bigger man who was wearing an oversized jacket. And witnesses, most of the witnesses say that those two men were still seen inside the store at around 10.47 p.m. that night as the girls were closing. Was there no security footage? Like back then, was the yogurt shop just like in a random spot or was it like in a cluster of shops? Like there was no security footage. And what was the motive? Was it just robbery or these girls had closed before? I mean, these the other two girls, the sister and the friend, obviously were not at the store every night. So was the motive that they had been watching these two girls and just waiting for them to close the shop one night and then to their advantage in a way, there were four girls that night to do horrible things to. That defense attorney, Amber Farrelly, doesn't think it had anything to do with money or a robbery because there was an open bank bag underneath the counter and that wasn't taken. And she just thinks that the motive for the crime was just pure evil, that those men did what they wanted to do that night to those poor girls and that their motive was to hurt these girls. And that was it. Amber believes that the mystery DNA belongs to one of those two men that were still in the store. And she believes that one day soon that they're going to know who these men are 
and that she probably will be involved when they find out who it is. And I mean, I hope they do, but at the same time, it's been 30 years, you know? So it's like over 30 years. So I don't know. Do you guys think that they're going to find who did it after all this time? I guess if they still have the DNA, but how do you even keep working on a case like this? You know, something that's so old. And the weird thing is these four boys that their lives were basically like, I mean, this is considering if they are not guilty, which I don't think they are, but these four boys were never, ever, ever seen at the yogurt shop. There was no witness accounts that these boys were even near the um, yogurt shop, you know? And the only reason they were even pulled in was because Maurice Pierce was found with a gun at the mall. But then when Maurice was pulled over by Frank the cop, why did he run? It's easy to say that, you know, he probably was guilty or maybe he had something in his car and something like that. But if he did, wouldn't they have found it in his car after he was killed? They obviously would have searched his car and, you know, maybe even his home and stuff like that. Wouldn't they have found some sort of evidence of something that he was guilty of? I think the fact that he ran was probably because he was like, oh my God, I don't want to be pulled in by the police again. He probably thought they were harassing him and that they targeted him by pulling him over. And I mean, there wasn't anything to suggest that Frank intentionally pulled Maurice over. I feel like it was a coincidence, but you know, Maurice after all these, I mean, it's been 30 years. And do you think your life will ever be the same? If even if you're accused of a crime, you've never been convicted, but you're always being looked at. You're probably always being interviewed. You're like you, you probably can't live a normal life until this case is solved because you're constantly being questioned. And I think he also ran due to the fact that Robert and Michael, their time in prison only took place as a result of the fact that they confessed. Well, they were coerced into confessing. What if Maurice ran or attacked the cop, which I'm no way, I'm not condoning the fact that he attacked the cop, but what if he did so purely because he was afraid of being forced into a confession as he knew they wanted this case closed? You know what I'm saying? Like, what if that was one of the reasons he was just afraid of being forced into something or, you know, who knows? I mean, the fact that at the very beginning of the investigation, these two mysterious men were 100% noted by witnesses to have been at the yogurt shop when um, the girls were closing up the shop. And then also that hustler guy who possibly could have left the back door open for more people to come in. Like, why was this never investigated? Like, how did you find Maurice, you know, in a in a shopping mall and be like, yep, yeah, he was the one that did it. But there was never any accounts of them being at the yogurt shop. But then these men that people were saying, yeah, there were two men at the yogurt shop. Why would they never found? Was it that difficult? I feel like it was shoddy police work. And you know, these poor four young girls, I feel like there should have been way more police resources or something. I don't know how it works, but put into this case. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think Maurice and those three boys are guilty? Do you think that they're 100% innocent? Do you think they have something to do with it? Like, I don't know. I, th I think they're not guilty. I don't know. If you have a different thought, let me know in the comments below. Um, but yeah, I really hope that this case does end up really getting solved. And if these boys are innocent, I hope that they just don't get pinned on something, you know, some technicality and end up going back to jail there. I feel like a lot of their life has just been wasted. I mean, false and coerced confessions are a real thing you know it's insane don't confess falsely guys don't do it i hope you guys enjoyed today's video i hope you found it interesting if you want to check out some of my other videos click over here and i will see you in the next one guys besitos Mwah. bye